Life Point. It is uh, good to be with you today as we uh, deal with another digging deeper uh, this week. Uh, my name is Wes Brandon. It's been uh, a minute since I've been with you on Digging Deeper, but thanks to Pastor Todd for letting me jump in with you this week. Uh, Pastor Q leading the message this week uh, at Life Point, dealing with uh, Romans chapter 6. And I know we covered uh, a lot, but uh, specifically there's a couple of verses, uh, verse 12 uh, through 14, that uh, is going to come up in the conversation. So let's just go through that really quickly. Uh, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you may obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. Yeah, good stuff. Uh, As we do every time in digging deeper, there's a few questions that we need to work through just to get the conversation uh, flowing. And the first one is, what did you like about the message today? Was there something that uh, stuck out to you that's memorable that you uh, connected with? So hit pause on the video and talk about that with uh, with your life group, small group. If that's where you are or if you're in a Bible study with friends, then uh, hit pause and take a minute to talk about what did you like about the message? Okay. Thanks for jumping back in with us. I hope you were able to get some conversation moving. Uh, Second question that we ask every time and digging deeper when we get started is, what did you disagree with in the message? Was uh, It may not be that you disagreed, but was there something that was unclear um, that you heard and you have more questions about or you're maybe scratching your head about going, I'm just not sure about that? Uh, what did you disagree with in the message? What were you uncertain about? Just hit pause and uh, talk about that with your with your group. Very good. Okay, question number three that we always uh, ask in digging deeper as we're getting things started is, what do you remember the most uh, from the message Sunday, something that was memorable to you. Maybe you took notes and you wrote that down, something you're going to carry with you uh, beyond Sunday. What did you remember the most from the message uh, this week? Hit pause. Let's take a minute and talk about that uh, in your small group. All right, very good. Thanks for coming back and uh, jumping in with us. So a couple of things I want to to launch with uh, and ask you to, uh, to to really kind of get a little deeper in the conversation. When you think about your own life and your own practices day to day, how do you typically respond when you fail at something? When you just fall flat, doesn't go the way that you had hoped or you planned, what's your typical response to that? Hit pause and let's go back into conversation with the people that you're in the room with. All right, thank you. I hope that uh, created some interesting uh, answers and conversations that you could share with one another. Next question is, how would you describe the difference between a sin and a mistake? Isn't that interesting? I don't know if that's something you've ever asked yourself or been asked before. How do you describe the difference between a sin and a mistake? Talk about that with your group. Okay, thanks for coming back. Um, The difference between a sin and a mistake. Uh, For me, I think the difference lies in the nature of the action. The difference between a sin and a mistake lies in the difference in the nature of the action. What's the intent behind it? Is it a, a moral or a spiritual implication? Um, maybe that's the difference for me and how we uh, address that. So as we move forward into digging deeper, oftentimes there will be a a parallel passage that we can discuss alongside of uh, the passage that came out of 
the message this week. So Q is dealing with Romans chapter 6. Um, I want us to think through, read through Galatians chapter 5, 16 through 18, as it does have a bit of a parallel message to what uh, Q was talking about. So let's read through that, or if you would read through that um, together. And as you uh, finish up reading it, I want you to talk with the group about what does it mean to walk by the Spirit in the context of Galatians 5.16. Again, we're, we're reading Galatians 5.16-18, through 18, and I really like to uh, often look at different translations of the Bible when I'm reading Scripture. For instance, uh, the one that you may read may say, walk by the Spirit. Um, the New Living Translation will say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. And the message uh, is really interesting. It says, live freely and animated and motivated by God's Spirit. So read Galatians 5, 16 through 18 out of as many translations as you like. And then talk about with your group, what does it mean to walk by the Spirit? Hit pause and uh, come back when you get through. All right, great. I hope that was an interesting conversation, probably generated some different perspectives. Uh, I think walking by this, walking in the Spirit, according to uh, Galatians 5, 16, uh, to me, it means living under the influence of the Holy Spirit rather than being controlled by sinful desires, selfish desires. Uh, the verse encourages us to follow the Spirit's leading, which helps us resist the temptations of the flesh. And when I say flesh, I just mean sinful nature that's in each one of us. And by walking in the Spirit, Christ followers can develop the fruit of the Spirit. You've heard that phrase before. You've probably read it before. Uh, the verses a little later in Galatians 5 talk about the fruits of the Spirit. And uh, you may have learned them as a kid. There was, used to be a song that uh, helped kids learn fruits of the Spirit. But they are listed in Galatians 5, 22 and 23 as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And against those things, there is no law. So while avoiding the harmful behaviors that are associated with sinful flesh, Paul is encouraging us to develop these fruits of the Spirit. And by walking hand in hand with the Holy Spirit, uh, consistently, that's the goal. Walking in the Spirit is, hey, let's do things the way that Jesus wants us to and avoid the harmful behaviors that are associated with sinful flesh, with selfish desires. Okay, let's move on. Question number two, how do the desires of the flesh oppose the desires of the Spirit? How do, do the desires of the flesh, sinful nature, oppose the desires of the Spirit. So hit pause and let's talk about that question among yourselves and see what kind of answers you come up with. And, um, you know, be attentive. Perhaps other people in your group will have different perspective that you haven't considered before, which could be helpful to you. So hit pause, come back when you're, uh, when you're finished with that conversation. All right. Thanks for, uh, for kicking it back over uh, uh, to join me. How do the desires of the flesh oppose the desires of the Spirit? The desires of the flesh oppose the desires of the Spirit because they're just fundamentally different in nature. They lead to different outcomes in the life of a believer or a Christ follower. But let's just talk about a, a breakdown of a few things, I think, of how they conflict. And these are just, they're not catch phrases, but they're just labels the way I look at them is, hey, here's a difference. Uh, here's a different uh, perspective as we talk about flesh versus spirit. So are we focusing on self or are we focusing on God? There's, there's a conflict there. Uh, are we dealing with sinful nature versus righteousness? And I remember Pastor Matt uh, earlier in the year, maybe in late last year, talked about righteousness and one of his sermons says Jesus is the standard of righteousness that we have to focus on and compare ourselves to. So the conflict or desires of the flesh opposing desires of the spirit, sinful nature versus the nature of Jesus. Um, another way of thinking through uh, the conflict or the opposition is 
Are we looking for immediate gratification or are we seeking long-term fulfillment, right? Sinful nature so often is driven by the desire for immediate gratification. I want what I want. I want it now, and I'm going to do whatever I can to get it now versus understanding God's plan for our life, fulfillment, uh, seeking righteousness the way he lays it out for us. Uh, a fourth way to uh, deal with the opposition of flesh and, and desire of spirit is thinking about uh, slavery versus freedom. It's kind of a simple approach to things, but what are you a slave to? Uh, are you a slave to sin? Are you a slave to debt? Are you a slave to sexual immorality? Are you a slave to gossip? Uh, what are the things in your life that are controlling to you that you need to shed and get rid of? Uh, as opposed to, hey, I'm seeking freedom in the life that Christ makes possible if I follow him and push the sinful desire of the flesh aside. And I think the uh, last one here, how do we uh, compare desire of the flesh to desire of the spirit? It's desires of the flesh, sinful nature, ultimately lead to death. But seeking Christ, the eternal life that he makes possible, lead us to life, eternal life. So those are a couple ways uh, of just thinking through that comparison. And uh, Paul contrasts the works of the flesh. Uh, this comes out of Galatians 5, 19 through 23. He, he's contrasting the works of the flesh with the fruit of the Spirit. Again, we read through what those were. But the works of the flesh, he lists. And uh, here's a list. It's like, yikes, look out. Sexual immorality, uh, impurity, idolatry, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition. Can you connect with that and relate to that in any way? Probably. Envy, drunkenness, and other sinful behaviors. Those are works of the flesh that Paul lists. Now let's contrast those, compare those to the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Quite the uh, opposition of those two lists, right? Uh, definitely opposing one another. So some good thoughts from uh, the Apostle Paul as, as we discuss that. Okay, next question. Why is there conflict? Why is there conflict between the flesh and the spirit in the life of a believer, the life of a Christ follower, those of us who call us Christians? Why is there a conflict between sinful nature, flesh, and the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer? Uh, hit pause and uh, talk about that with your group and see what you come up with. Okay, I can imagine that's some interesting answers that you came up with. I hope there was something that maybe prompted you to think differently. Uh, why is there conflict between the flesh and the spirit in the life of a believer? It happens between, the conflict is something that happens between two opposing forces, right? And that's the case here. The flesh is our sinful attitude and nature, uh, human nature. And the Holy Spirit, on the other hand, leads believers towards godliness, righteousness, and living according to God's purposes. It's what he wants for us. And so I'm going to list out for you, in my mind, here are a couple of key reasons for the conflict. As we mentioned, there are you know, opposing desires. we just seeking different things. Flesh wants one thing, and uh, the Holy Spirit leads us into something else. So what does that look like? Well, we have two natures. Uh, after we receive salvation as a believer, so Christ followers or new believers are given a new nature through the Holy Spirit. But that old sinful nature is still hanging around. And this creates that tension in life that makes us, you know, tempted, hard to, hard to deal with, where we want what we want, selfish ambition, uh, sinful choices. And we deal with choices every day, right? Christ followers must continually choose Jesus. Yes, we do have a choice. That's one of the freedoms God gives us when we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. We get to choose, and we made a choice by accepting Jesus, right? Um, but this really means dependence on the Spirit and pushing back against that evil one's influence in everyday life. And so that comes only by choosing every single day 
Uh, it's not just a once every now and then. We have to get after it every single day and make that choice. Uh, the sanctification process. Why is there conflict between flesh and the spirit in the life of a believer? Well, I want to talk about the sanctification process with you. And the conflict is part of the sanctification process. Believers grow in a spiritual maturity until the day that Jesus comes back for us, when he comes back for his bride, uh, the church. The Holy Spirit empowers believers to overcome the flesh. But it is a long-term, lifelong battle until we are fully transformed into eternity. And again, that's going to happen when Jesus comes back. Uh, for us. So that sanctification process is not a one-time deal. It should happen every day in the life of a believer as we mature and draw closer to Jesus with the relationship to the Holy Spirit. So in essence, the conflict exists between the two because flesh and the Spirit, they just pull us in opposite directions and believers have to choose. We need to choose. We must choose to walk by the Spirit and to live a life that pleases God. That's the goal. That's what we're striving for. Jesus' followers must choose him every day. And we get to make that choice. How can we resist? Question number four. How can we resist the desires of the flesh according to this passage in Galatians? So if you need to, go back and read the, the verses again, starting with Galatians 5.16. Uh, maybe through 23, and talk about how can we resist the desires of the flesh according to what Paul mentions in this passage. So uh, take a break, hit pause on the video, have that discussion, ask the questions, and then come back. Very good. These are not simple questions. They're not necessarily quick answers, are they? They take some thought and the perspective of digging, drilling down. Uh, according to Galatians 5, we can, I say we, believers, Christ followers, can resist the desires of the flesh by relying on the Holy Spirit and choosing spiritual practices that align them with God's will. And so how does that work? What can, what can we do? Here's some key ways to resist the flesh uh, that I know of uh, based on this passage. In uh, Galatians 5, 16, Paul says, walk in the Spirit, walk by the Spirit, uh, walk in the Spirit. Uh, a practical step to make that happen, regularly pray for the Spirit's guidance and strength in moments of temptation. So it's not just a one-time thing. It's not a once-a-week thing. It's not really even a once-a-day thing. It's an ongoing, you know, another other scripture, Paul says, pray without ceasing. I think that kind of works here when we're talking with the Holy Spirit. It is an ongoing conversation throughout the day that we can walk together with him and ask him, hey, I need your help. Uh, a second uh, key may be be led by the Spirit. Paul talks about that in 518. I think that goes hand in hand. It may be even hard to discern the difference, walk by the Spirit and be led by the Spirit. But again, ask for the Spirit's wisdom before making decisions, especially when you're faced with some temptations or, or moral choices. Uh, it's a good practice to ask the Holy Spirit for wisdom and be led by Him in that. Uh, another key, a third way, uh, comes out of Galatians 5.24, is crucify the flesh. You know, what does that even mean? Crucify the flesh. Well, let's identify specific areas of sin in our life, in your life, uh, that just need to be carved out of our life that are getting in our way. If you don't know what they are, ask the Holy Spirit to show you what they are. He will. Uh, and then let's take some practical steps to remove or avoid those particular temptations. Maybe I don't go to this particular environment where I'm tempted with that, or I put this influence away so it doesn't have access to me as often as it has. And um, I, I want to try to remove those temptations while I'm relying on the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, for strength and wisdom. So crucify the flesh means, hey, let's get rid of those uh, temptations, right? To, to get carve those sins out of our life. And uh, a fourth way, how do we resist the desires of the flesh? Again, cultivate the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 talk about fruits of the Spirit. Again, I'll, I'll just list them out for you if I can get them right here. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. I missed someone. What's the last one? 
self-control. These are virtues that grow as the Spirit's influence grows in our life, in the life of a believer. And they naturally are going to push out the desires of the flesh. So when we develop the fruits of the Spirit, the desires of the flesh are now pushed out of sight, maybe out of arm's reach. They don't coexist together well, right? So when we stop focusing on gifts of the Spirit, maybe those selfish ambitions, sinful nature creeps in, but they really don't coexist well. Uh, some time ago, I was in the coffee house. Uh, I had the pleasure of teaching there, and I shared at one point this concept of how you can't really deal with anxiety and depression and woe is me if you're spending all your time praising and worshiping and having an attitude of gratitude, that part of your brain that develops and deals with and controls gratitude, praise, and worship cannot operate at the same time as depression, uh, anxiety, those kind of things. Same here, I, I believe that if we are focusing on living out the fruits of the Spirit, developing them, then we're not going to be focusing on sinful flesh, sinful desires. And so I think that's a good practice to work on. Maybe choose one of those fruits of the Spirit today or maybe this week. Try to develop it. Ask the Holy Spirit, help me work on a fruit of the Spirit so I can push away desires of the flesh. Desires of the flesh. Um, Another key, perhaps, in uh, in the conflict of how do I deal with, you know, desires of the flesh, live in step with the Spirit. I think it's very similar to walking in the Spirit or being led by the uh, uh, Spirit. Uh, start each day by asking the Holy Spirit to help you stay aligned with God's will. You know, check in regularly with, through prayer and direction uh, with Him every day. Uh, I think a good practice is, yes, when you wake up, it's maybe a good a good idea to say, Lord, thanks for giving me breath today. Thanks for letting my feet hit the floor. Thank you that my body works to the capacity that it does. But then approach the Holy Spirit with, Holy Spirit, I want all you have for me today. I want to walk in the fruits of the Spirit. I want to operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit that you have for me every day. Uh, I want to, to just exemplify those fruits of the Spirit Lord, I want to be kind and patient and loving and uh, the, the way that we're encouraged. And if you ask the Holy Spirit that first thing in the, in the morning, he's going to help you. He's going to make you aware. How do, I, how do I make those things happen? So, you know, one more. Just remember the conflict is ongoing. It's not a, it's not a one-time deal. And when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, all your sinful desires don't just go away. Uh, right? We are redeemed for the curse of the law. We're forgiven for those sins because Jesus shed his blood on the cross. But that conflict is going to continue. The evil one, you know, we know scripture says he's devouring. He's, he's you know, moving around us looking for a way just to devour us. So a practical step is don't forget that overcoming the flesh is a daily process. It requires consistent effort, prayer, and dependence on God in our connection to Lord Jesus is through the Holy Spirit. So talk to him every single day. Resist the desires of the flesh. Galatians 5 calls us to walk by the Spirit, be led by the Spirit, crucify the flesh, cultivate the fruit of the Spirit, and then live in step with the Spirit. Some of those things sound the same, right? They overlap, that's true. But it really means that there needs to be a, co a commitment by you to rely on the Spirit's power every day. All right, last question. What are some practical ways to be led by the Spirit in everyday life? So I'm asking you to uh, hit pause, discuss this with your crew, with your group that you're in. What are some practical ways to be led by the Spirit in everyday life? I think we've discussed some of those. Maybe you think of things that we haven't talked about yet, talk about with your group. So please hit pause, Talk about practical ways to be led by the Spirit in your everyday life and then come back. All right, cool. Uh, I hope that you uh, were able to come up with some, some interesting conversation there and answers to that question. How can we be led by the Spirit every day? We talked about daily prayer for guidance. Start every morning with that prayer. Holy Spirit, lead me today. I want everything you have for me today. Um, and continue 
I want to walk in obedience with your guidance today. Uh, meditate on scripture. What does that mean, meditate? Well, practically, I think we need to set aside some time to read and reflect on God's word every single day. Um, we need to be memorizing uh, Bible verses, uh, key verses, to remind you of the Spirit's principles in the day. You know, when you remember or you memorize scripture, the Holy Spirit has a way of just prompting that and bringing it back into your focus when it's needed. When you face temptations, when you face choices, those scriptures come back to you when you need them, but you have to know them before you can get that recall. So it's important to memorize uh, scripture uh, as you read and reflect on it. Practice. Uh, practice listening to the Holy Spirit. It's not easy. Uh, I'm often not very patient when it comes to listening to the Holy Spirit. I ask the Holy Spirit to talk to me, and then I'm continue on in the conversation, and I'm doing the talking, and I'm not setting aside any time to listen. Uh, but before you make decisions or you re respond to a difficult situation, just take a pause and ask the Holy Spirit, what would you want me to do right here? And then do your best to wait uh, for a sense of peace that comes on you or some direction that the Holy Spirit may lead you to. I'm going to encourage you to obey the promptings of the Spirit uh, uh, immediately. Practical ways to be led by the Spirit in everyday life? Do it. When you feel like the Holy Spirit is uh, asking you, hey, go talk to that person, go speak to someone, go offer help to a person that you see that just needs, has a need or you, or you need to help, or maybe you need to make a change in your attitude, act on that immediately. That's the Holy Spirit uh, prompting you with some wisdom and some counsel. Just work it doing it. Answer it. Act on it quickly. Uh, cultivate those fruits of the Spirit. We've talked about that already. That's a good way just to, you know, once a day, once a week, pick one. Try to develop it. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you. I would say seek godly counsel is a good way to, to uh, you know, practice walking in the Spirit. Uh, when you face significant decisions, when you're seeking, seek advice. Uh, from a trusted uh, Christian brother, a friend, a pastor, a mentor, somebody that you know who walks closely to God, whether you're close to them or not, if you approach somebody and say, hey, I see you walking in obedience to the Lord in your life. I have a question. I need some help. Would you help me? They will. Uh, I'd say another opportunity is to practice gratitude and worship. We talked about that a little bit earlier is when we practice gratitude, worship, and praise, it pushes those selfish ambitions, selfish desires out of our uh, life on a regular basis. So throughout the day, thank God for his blessings. Take a moment to praise him, especially during those challenging situations. But, you know, you could be driving, you could be, oh, you know, laying in the bed, whatever. But, um, you know, King David in uh, Psalm 119 uh, shares this. He says, in the morning, I ask for your counsel. I ask for your help, Lord. And then seven times a day, I come to you praising and worshiping. Seven times a day. I don't know what the magic number is about seven. We, You can do a study on that about how se seven is a godly number. But he says seven times a day, I'm going to praise and worship. I think that's an awesome uh, approach, great perspective, and something we need to practice. I would encourage you to be sensitive to uh, conviction. If you sense conviction about something you've done or an attitude that you've had that probably not right and you, you come to understand that, just confess it to God immediately and ask the Holy Spirit to help you change it. He will. He will. Practical ways to be led by the Spirit. Choose humility. Just offer your plans to God saying, hey, it's not my will, but yours and be open to the Holy Spirit directing you and where he wants you to go. It's not about me. It's about him. My life should be about him, right? Uh, stay connected to a church community. What you're doing right now is spending time with a small group. It's a big deal, and it's a big win. Be active in your church. Attend services. Get into small groups, what you're doing now, I hope. And um, serve in areas where the Spirit's prompting you. There's always an opportunity to serve in your community or in church. Uh, we are built for spiritual community. Uh, make that happen. And I'd say just acknowledge that you're dependent on the Spirit. Um, you know, Holy Spirit, every simple prayer throughout the day. I need your help and I need your guidance right now. And be open to that. 
So to be led by the Spirit in everyday life, engage in prayer, meditate on Scripture, listen to the Spirit's promptings, obey, cultivate those fruits of the Spirit we talked about, seek godly counsel, practice humility and gratitude. It's not about me, it's about you, Lord. And these practices can can keep keep you connected to the Holy Spirit and the voice. So I hope this has been a good conversation with you. Thanks for the opportunity to sit with you digging deeper into scripture and uh, kind of paralleling that to the message that Q brought on Sunday. Let's pray as we finish up. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we are, are so aware of your presence in our life. Uh, we see so many things going on in our world that are evil uh, people that need you in their lives, people that need help. We've seen the disasters that are happening and our heart goes out to them. Be present with them, Lord. Uh, help them to feel that they are loved and that all hope is not lost. And as long as you're with them, there is always hope and salvation. Lord, I pray that you would be with us until we have the opportunity to come together again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. And hey, we'll see you at church.